Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that um, you pour your life into us like that well overflowing. Lord, uh, you know, we're thankful that we will sing to you forever. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Oh, what a privileged position we're in. Lord, I ask that as uh, I speak today that you would help me, help us all to listen. May grace be evident here. May our hearts be changed. And in the name of Christ, I rebuke every evil scheme today, anything distracting. Lord, let the word of God be heard here this morning. Holy Spirit, be the spirit of truth. Amen. How did we end up here? So, um, I told you I was going to tell you a story about a road, okay? So in about 2008, well, I know it was 2008 because I have a photo and it says November 2008. And, uh, you know, so I know that's true. Um, my father and I uh, went f for a trip to America. We flew to New York and then we were going to, he was meeting up with Ken Gill and some others in Kansas City, which is sort of in the middle of America. And um, we decided to drive there. I, I was all in favor of that because I wanted to see some of America. And we went down through New Jersey and Philadelphia and, you know, and just wound our way out, seeing a few people my father knew and then wound our way back. We got to see Lou Angle in Kansas City, the International House of Prayer. And uh, it was good because just a couple of years earlier, Kent and I and a few others went to the call in, in Sydney, if you remember. And I, he's, he's the guy who promotes the call. If you don't know about that, re read that up. And anyway, it was a great time. But anyway, we're going to come home. Time to come home, driving back. Um, and we had to get, we we're flying out of JFK. But, um, and that's, but we're staying just on the edge of Long Island, which if we're coming from Kansas City, it's on the opposite side of New York. Okay, so and I'm just following the GPS because I don't know my way around New York and I was the designated driver. Um, just, no, I was asked to, that sounds better. I was just asked to drive. <laughs> so I'm driving the hire car and, and we're coming in from the west into uh, New York and we come upon this. This is the Lincoln Tunnel. Okay, it's, it's on the um, west side of New York, on the, I think that's the Hudson River. I'm not great on American geography, but you can see New York in the distance. We come around this massive U-turn into the Lincoln Tunnel. The Lincoln Tunnel is 1.5 mile long, so about 2.4 k's long. And the last thing I remember before driving into this tunnel was take exit 439,000. <laughs> That's all I remember. And about 200 meters in, the GPS goes zip. It's done. There's no take exit written on it anymore. I should have written that bit down because that disappears as well. So you're going through this tunnel and as you're coming out there, so there's, there's exits off the tunnel. I mean, you've been in tunnels in Australia, like even in Brisbane, there's exits off like to go to different parts of the city. I'm thinking, what, you know, what do you do? And then, to make matters worse, I obviously took the wrong one because I end up in a multi-level car park. <laughs> uh, and Dad was not impressed about this because one, we had to pay to get out. <laughs> and New York parking isn't cheap. But also, they didn't have, like, you, you go through the boom gate and you don't have a nice little thing there where you can just turn, it, like, I, I remember going up about three or four levels. <laughs> turning around and going down again, right? And then paid some money and then came out to that, right? And I can, I kid you not, there, was, there wasn't a satellite to be found. <laughs> Star, Starlink was not working that day. So, um, and, you know, you ask yourself the question, how did we end up here? Like dad's a bit cranky, like he, he never gets cranky obviously, but he was a bit cranky that day. And um, I didn't feel like it was my fault. Um, and we're in the middle of New York City, there's one way streets everywhere, people are driving the wrong way as it is. And yellow cabs everywhere. Um, and, and in a place where you don't know where to go and, and you're asking yourself, how did I end up here? And because I'm not going to come back to this story, I, we, just, we just followed east. 
just any street that would take east, we went east until buildings disappeared and we could get some signal and then it, it like delayed us like two hours that. Going into that tunnel where we lost GPS signal uh, delayed about two hours, okay? And, and you're thinking, how did we end up here? Anyway, today I'm gonna talk about, um, I like talking about relationships, I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about repentance. And then somehow I gotta weave that word waymaker in. Because that, through worship I was just hearing waymaker, you know? How did we end up here? Anyway, I had, um, because I want to relate it to relationships, because I believe relationships are really important. Um, a couple of my stories will be about marriage because, um, anyway, that's obviously a relationship some of us have that um, is a, just tends to be in your face a lot more. But, you know, relationships within church people is just as important. Anyway, I had a similar thing in my marriage. You know, it's, in 2002 I started, it was like I was in Kansas City heading for the Hamptons, you know? Just, it was all, you know, got the GPS going all good. And yet, um, basically after a little while, found myself in a car park after a long tunnel, <laughs> trying to work out where I was going. How did we end up here? And not a GPS in sight. <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, how did this happen? How did I end up here? And, um, you know, church, Church relationships are pretty similar to that too. I, like, I've met people, known people. I mean, people might feel the same way about me. I, I, I generally try to keep a fairly open relationship, but if you feel that way about me, come and talk to me. And I've told stories in the thing where I've, I've had to talk to people in our church, mostly guys my own age, obviously, where, you know, something starts small and you get to a place and you think, how, how did we end up here? I, I don't, and it's not like oh, you pretend like you talk to them, but you just happen to avoid, like you never spend any time with it. It's like an elephant in the room. You, you know what I mean? And, and it's just easier to avoid people and um, start small. And we have great stories with people like Graham where people have chosen right. You know, and you might have the odd niggle, but things happen and you think, okay. What are we going to choose here? So that's good. But there will be people in this fellowship today who feel like, in terms of relationships with each other, you're in a multi-story car park up the top somewhere without a GPS and you know you've got to pay to get out. And, and you know that it's going to be probably hard work to get out as well um, and maybe a bit of just tracking east until you find some light and then, you know, one step of, at a time sort of thing. But we need to repent. The gospel says, in fact, it was at the Last Supper, Jesus Christ said, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So when I'm talking about repentance, I'm acknowledging that turning from sin is important. And even though repentance is about turning and and you have to put your faith in something. So repentance works with faith together because it's not just turning from sin. You actually have to then put your faith in Christ. It's both those things. But today especially, I, I want to apply it into relationships because of that commandment, the new commandment given. Love one another as I have loved you. I, I presume we're all Christians here that we've repented, you know, turning towards Christ. Anyway, my challenge today is what about what about some of the relationships in your life? Is it time to repent um, of attitudes held, things happening in relationships? Um, so that's the challenge today. 1 John 2.10 says, and 11, The one who loves his brother remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in the darkness, doesn't know where he's going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And relationship with God is important, but of equal importance is our relationship with one another. And if you are feeling like you're in a spot, I mean, it might be in your marriage, that's a pretty common one for people who are married, but then with other people, maybe your kids, just other people in the church, uh, or people in another church that you left because it got too hard and you got offended, so you moved. That applies to this too, because we're one body. And maybe you need to think about those relationships. 
And we need to protect and build those relationships. So if you feel like you're in a how did I get here moment, why am I in the top of a multi-level car park going in circles and I don't want to pay to get out, but I have to. You know, if you feel you're either there for eternity or you have to pay to get out um, and then find some light. If you're there, that's the challenge. We need to protect and build those relationships. So the Bible says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. Um, when we read that scripture, we often think about our lives, eternal life, and it's obviously a great application for that. But it's interesting getting scriptures like that and then applying them to our lives right, right here on earth, like coming to steal relationships, kill joy, you know, destroy things. Um, and the enemy's strategy is division, okay? Um, for this destruction, he wants to destroy, but the strategy is division. And the Bible says, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. So if the, if the enemy wants to come and steal, kill and destroy, his strategy is division. So if you have an offense, a division, a broken relationship with someone, the enemy is winning. His tactic is working on you, okay? It's working. And you're just walking along with it on that road uh, to, to destruction. You're on that road. And guess what? It's not obvious, okay? Because if it was obvious, we wouldn't stand for it, would we? It's, it's like someone putting a nasty sin in front of your face. You say, no, that's wrong. I wouldn't do that. The problem with these sort of things is they're not obvious. Um, and we tend to, they start small. And we, like I always thought there would be, I always thought in life there would be, you'd come to a crossroads and you'd get to choose. You know, the path you want to take. You get to choose the wide highway that leads to discretion, d destruction or you got to choose the narrow road. But unfortunately, it's not like that. It's, it's um, little, little choices. And I've said before, you make your choices and your choices make you. And then at the end of that 100 or 1,000 or 2,000 choices, you get to a place where you're in a car park going in circles in the dark with seemingly no light or direction, thinking, how did I end up here? Why, you know, I've been through a tunnel, like just completely lost. But we just read a scripture that says the ones who are lost are the ones who don't have the relationship with their brothers. That if you keep the relationship with your brothers right, you're in the light. So, Jesus spoke about some of these things on the Sermon on the Mount. And um, to me, like, I'm not a... Um, Theologian, all which is why I leave people like David talking about Israel and you know all those hard subjects. But Sermon on the Mount to me is is Jesus talking to his people, saying, "I'm bringing a kingdom, but guess what? You can live it here and now. You don't have to wait till you die." And he starts talking about things that says the kingdom of God can be lived now. And that's why in the middle of the Lord's prayer, we say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, right? That, as Christians, that's what we are seeking. The kingdom of God started with Christ. And we don't have to wait till we die for some of these, for some of these things to take place. And when uh, Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, he was talking about law, but then he was raising the bar. Uh, like I talk about upgrades. He, he, he brought in some upgrades. So he said to people, you've heard long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone subject to murder will be judged. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to ju uh, judgment. He says, anyone who says you fool will be da in the danger of fire of, the old, fire of hell. So he just took something that was law in the Old Testament and gave it an upgrade. He just leveled it up. Okay, you thought this? Boom, not anymore. And what the challenge from Jesus was saying, yeah, that's all good, but if you want to see heaven on earth, like you've got a chance to live heaven right now. So don't worry about killing people. Get your relationships right. 
Okay? That, that's how you'll get heaven on earth. And so, and he, and he said, if you call someone a fool, you'll be in danger of the fires of earth. And that, that word means like empty or, or worthless. That's like, when he's saying fool, that's, that's what he means. And, um, and, and I know that's, that can happen very easily in relation, like you're not calling someone stupid, you're calling them worthless. It's like disdain. It's, it's not giving someone the light of day that they, that they um, deserve. It says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and, therefore, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. I love this one. Do it while you're still together. On the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you'll not get out until you've paid that last penny. And, um, you know, calling someone a fool, being in dangers of the fire of hell. You know, Jesus teaches us that long before something happens in life, it happens in our heart. And the word Jesus used for hell there was a word called Gehenna. And, I mean, it's literally translated in the Bible lots of times, meaning eternal hell. So I'm not, I'm not taking out the eternal consequences of sin. But Gehenna was... Um, a rubbish dump at, in Jerusalem. And it used to be, um, in the old days, it used to be somewhere where they used to uh, um, sacrifice kids to Molech. That's where Gianna was. And, but then um, one of the kings, David will know which one, he, he kiboshed all those practices and it just turned into a rubbish dump. But they used to burn animals there. It, it was basically a smouldering piece of dodginess. Like it was bad, okay? It smelt. And it was Josiah. Josiah um, cancelled those practices. He doesn't have to fix me up next week. <laughs> Josiah cancelled those practices. So they didn't, um, you know, they didn't do this child sacrifice anymore, but it was still a, a smelly rubbish dump. Oh, it was fire. It was on fire all the time as well. And it never went out. Okay, And so Jesus comes in and says on his sermon on his mount, on his upgrade sermon, that says if, if you call someone worthless, if you don't give them consideration, if you don't, if you're in your relationships, if you're not considering them great, then you'll be in the dangers of the fires of Gehenna, of hell. And you will be if that continues, but we also know that anger and unresolved conflict can make your life up a living hell. So we call that bitterness. And what happens is when you let those things grow in your heart, they, they burn and they churn and, and it's like your life itself is on fire and it's like a downward spiral. And so my challenge for you today when we're talking about repentance, because a repentance is a change of mind, it is to identify these things and, and deal with them. We need to deal with bitterness and resentment and offence. Mainly we need to get our relationships right. Resentment's a hard one because it literally means to re-feel. Re is again and... Um, the sente comes from a Latin word, means to feel. And so, so that with bitterness, what happens is every time something happens, it'll remind you, it'll grow. I, I've spoken in an earlier sermon about the wall of resentment. It's like a brick and every time something little happens, you, you're putting a brick in the wall. And, and for Krista and I, like 10 years in, we had a massive wall, just, just of bricks, like that built over time. And... Um, yeah, so you are like in that car park with no light shining in and nowhere to go. And you think, how did I end up here? Um, it's a destructive spiral. It's compounding, worse than interest. 
and increasing. And if you're wise enough to recognize it, you would do something about it. And the closer you are to someone, the easier it is to build that wall. I know it doesn't make sense, but you remember uh, in the Bible, Jesus said, um, talking about like your brother in Christ, don't um, pull the speck out of his eye until you remove the log in yours. Remember that scripture? And, but how close do you reckon you have to be to someone to see a speck in their eye? Like pretty close, right? So like see Michael's down the back, if he has a speck in his eye, uh, I'm not, I can't see that. Like, I don't know. But if you're face to face someone, then that's, that's the area you can see specks. Now we're not supposed to pull them out anyway because of the obvious logs in our eyes, but, but in terms of that sort of offense, what it's saying is if you're seeing specks, you're close, okay? And that's how it works in the relationships. As relationships get more intimate, there's more chance of intimate and love growing, but there's actually way more chance of offense and resentment growing as well. Both those things are together. And that's what I'm going to talk about repentance really soon because you actually have to, if you're wise enough to recognize it, you'd do something about it. You'd recognize what's happening and then make choices to stop the bitterness growing. Okay, you can let the affection grow, that's okay. So Jesus' advice was to settle quickly, um, do it while you are still together. You know, um, I was listening to a, I listened to this marriage podcast and people ring in and, and this guy rang in and he said, I, you know, he, he realized that he needed to fix his marriage. He said, but everything I do doesn't work. And the guy said, how long have you been married? And I think he said, oh, and his wife kept on criticizing him. That's right. She kept on just saying nasty things about him to other people. Like it was pretty dire. And he said, how long have you been married? I think he said 35 years. And you could just hear the guy sigh on the radio. Just, and he basically said, mate, it, that's a big brick wall. Like 35 years of uh, building up bricks. Because it, what I found is it generally takes as long to undo a bricks out of a wall as it does to build it. Thank goodness for the goodness of God and grace because sometimes he can transform lives. But I know in my own life that was more a manual process. Like you pray... For, but you still have to make the physical choices to do certain things to unbuild a brick wall. And people do say, I think, David, you should speak about free will because I don't really understand this. I just have a concept about it. But people say, why can't I pray and get changed? You know, why can't there just be a miracle and 35 years of resentment goes out the window? And I think it has something to do with free will because God didn't create robots. Like he, because otherwise he'd do that to everyone right now. I, somehow it's not what he created. He created free will. He wanted people to work and choose and make value judgments and unbuild brick walls that they, they, that they built rather than an abracadabra solution. And I think it's linked to free will because otherwise, but anyway. That's why I think sometimes we pray for stuff and, and yet it comes back to us walking the journey of making restitution for the wrongs we did rather than it just being fixed like magic. So anyway, Jesus' solution, his, he was saying deal with it while you're still together. Deal with it on the way or we will not end well with you. Unchecked resentment leads to regret it all starts small, and the quicker you deal with it, the better it is. So if there's something small in a relationship, but it's still too awkward to deal with, um, you need to deal with it. And I think you need to deal with it in your own heart. Like I've been thinking a lot about how to deal with resentment, because sometimes it's quite possible that the other person doesn't know. I mean, sometimes in marriage, it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, and they'll tell you, you know, any time you ask. But in some relationships, it's not obvious and, and, and they've offended you or you've offended them and you don't, like, it's like a one-sided trend. You know, if, because offense is pretty easily taken sometimes and like, I know I'll say stuff. I was, I was with Alex last week 
you know, I went to Adelaide and preached in his church. And he said, I offended him one day because, um, and I, I would have only thought I was having a joke. Apparently I was on, on, on the piano and I turned around and said, something sounds terrible and it's coming from this direction. And he was in the general vicinity of that arm's reach. And but the bass player was in there too. So like, why would he take offense? I could have been having to go with the bass player, you know? And anyway, we all take offenses. He told me that story. I didn't even know about it. I didn't even know I said it. Forgot about it. Done. I move on. He's left in the Gihanna of stinking rubbish. Okay? No, he's not really because he was joking about it with me. But that sort of thing happens, okay? It does happen. Little circumstances, it happens, and you end up in a down. Just deal with it quickly. So, like I said, most of the time it's not obvious. We get these great road signs in Australia that say, wrong way, go back. <laughs> but we don't get them. Like, um, if you go out to the dual highway, because my dad lives on Access 8, if you come out Access 8 and don't cross the road before you turn right and want to turn right, there's a big sign right there that says, wrong way, go back. It, you know, it's right there. I wish sometimes in marriage there was a big sign like that, like three weeks in. <laughs> Wrong way, go back. If there was, I missed it. Okay? And the 40 others after that. But I, I presume they weren't there. Or I'm male and can't read emotions or something. Something happened and I missed the signs. Okay? And what that meant is, like I said, the enemy starts small. The, the tactic is division. And a lot of time, us Christians don't recognize it. Happy to take the offense. Happy to let the resentment wall build. You know, bitterness in Hebrew, it talks about a bitter root that defiles, like grows to defile many. And you see that in churches. A little bitter root starts, grow, 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 and then defiles. And um, you make your choices, and your choices make you. So there'll probably be none of those signs. Sorry? Repentance. So we need to... We need to repent. I mean, we have a lot of sin that we need to repent of, but I'm talking today about relationships. We need to repent. So the New Testament word for repentance, it's Greek. It's called metanoia. Okay? And literally, it means to change your mind. So it is a decisive change in direction. It's a change in the way I think that leads to a change in the way I live. Now... I've been thinking about this. Is it a change of heart or change of mind? If you look in like Merriam-Webster's dictionary, she'll talk about change of heart. But if you look in the Greek word metanoia, it literally says a change of mind. And to me, that's separate to feelings. Okay? Um, repentance starts with a I was wrong. I mean, that's pretty hard to say. I have not... I reckon like... I haven't heard many people in my whole life say I was wrong. I have heard people apologize, but for someone to come out and say I was wrong, that's a pretty rare thing to hear. But that's where repentance starts. And it's a change of mind. Sorry? I've used that very word. You have? Have you? Yeah, I just said them then. <laughs> Do you listen? Anyway. I was wrong. I said it again. Three times in one day. Um, So, and repentance demands action and not just sorrow. I mean, Ethan will know this. He comes up to me, he's done something, he says, I was sorry. And I said, I, I often say to him, Ethan, I don't care if you're sorry, honestly. You've said that like five times. Unless you actually do something different, the sorry means nothing. And I have, you can ask him, I say that to him. I don't want your sorry. I'd rather you go out and I'll see a different, a different, you do something different, you know? Anyway, saying sorry to someone is nice as well, but the action is better. So, repentance starts with saying I was wrong, but it actually is a change of thinking, change of attitude, which goes to a change of action, which then follows up with changes of feelings and values. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to say here is it's not a change of feeling that leads to a change of action. It's a change of mind, a change of thinking that leads to a change of action 
that leads to a change of feeling. The, the feeling comes later, okay? It's like, um, Krista said to me yesterday when we were talking about this, she goes, it's like when we go into dancing lessons, when we're engaged, you know, you hated it. And I did, I always felt so uncomfortable. And um, like, because I'm not the most flexible guy or, you know, coordinated and it felt weird. But then in, in part of my repentance to my relationship, Krista and I started going to dancing lessons two years ago, right? We've done them now for two years every week. And now I love it because I made a change of mind. I, like one of Krista's whinges about me was I'd never dance at weddings. It like, I'd just say dancing isn't for me. I, I don't dance. I've heard heaps of blokes say that, I don't dance. And I decided, okay, dancing is for me. Change of mind, right? Change of thinking, dancing is for me. So then I changed my actions. So if I'm gonna say dancing is for me, how do I change my actions? Well, I go, go do something that Chris always wanted to do and that's go get some dance lessons. And um, the cheap ones were on Tuesday night in the group ones and I, I never have Tuesday nights free. So we pay for private lessons every single week that costs a fortune. But a change in mind causes a change in actions which then causes a change in feeling. And now it's one of my favorite times of the week. And, and sometimes we're not even that happy with each other on a Monday when we go to dancing, but it's always good afterwards because you're spending time together. We know we enjoy it. Uh, it's like a reverse resentment. Like the memory, like you, you do the action and it brings a re-feeling, but it's a, it's a good one, not a bad one. You know, oh, that's right, we like this. Yeah, and then off it goes. You know, it's good. So that is what, what repentance is. But along with repentance, you also then have Confession. You need to confess to God and the person. Okay, both those things. You have, you need to confess, like not just the other person, but to God. Then there has to be restitution. You actually have to pay for what you've done. You've got to pay to get out of that car park. And then there has to be a change of direction. Then you've got to head east, get away from the buildings. So that's what repentance is. That's what I did in that New York car park. I repented. You know, and paid to get out of that car park, headed east until the buildings disappeared, and then got back on the right path. Same as, you know, the dancing. Just, just made just what seems like normal, logical, everyday decisions. And you'll need to do that in some of your own relationships, whether it be marriage or between you. If you know there's relationship issues between you, you'll need to change your mind about that and let the feelings follow later. Like, compare Peter and Judas, okay? Peter denies Christ, Judas betrays Christ, both were sorrowful, okay? Both were sorry. That's why I don't put much credit in the I was sorry bit. Judas was sorry. He even tried to make restitution. He even, tried, he, he even brought the money back. But you know what he didn't do that Peter ended up doing? Talk to Jesus. So Peter came back and talked to Jesus and Judas never did. He went to the high priest or whoever, tried to make restitution. There was no confession to Jesus. There was sorrow. There was, I was wrong. There was restitution. But didn't go and, he didn't go and settle it with God. Or in this case, like it was Jesus who he, he offended against. You, you, you need to settle it while you are still together because obviously Judas's path then led to destruction, okay? He didn't repent where Peter did. Prodigal son, okay? Another example, a guy takes half his dad's money or third or whatever was the inheritance rights at the time for the second son, goes, spends it all, ends up eating pig food and then follow the chain of action now. Okay, what does the Bible say? He came to his senses. So he's sitting there eating pig food thinking, there's something crazy what's happening here because my father's servants get to eat good food and live in good lodgings and I'm eating pig food. So did he have a change? It was a change of thinking, right? He, it actually says he came to his senses. It was a change of thinking. That led to a change of action I'm going home. That led to confession. He said, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. He confessed to God, he confessed to his dad 
rest, like, and then the father, like that situation was restored, restoration. So even in the story of the prodigal son, there's changes of mind. And the point I'm getting to you today is some of these things you have to logically change your mind and take a different course of action before the feelings will follow, okay? I often say um, feelings follow habits, like, like the dancing, like um, I never used to hold Krista's hand ever. I, I wasn't a PDA guy and, and then Krista said to me, I need you to hold my hand. And, and now, it fit, I felt really weird doing it, like everyone was looking at you, don't worry, no one's looking at you. And uh, no one cares. Um, and then I, it's just normal now. Feelings follow habits. So if you can get your mind in gear and change your thinking, change your direction, repentance is a literal 180, change your mind, change your direction, then the feelings follow if you're worried about feelings. So repentance starts with I was wrong. It demands action and not just sorrow. Confess your sin to God and others. Resolve to make restitution and walk in the new path. And, um, and that's what I did in my relationship with my wife, at least. You know, when we went in that multi-story car park after a long two and a half K tunnel and you don't know where you're going and you know you've got to pay to get out. Um, I realised that at the time, I think Jacinda was a little, um, I was playing touch footy twice a week. I was training for AFL either training for AFL or coming to a men's meeting here on Tuesday and Thursday. Playing sad day, of course, got to play footy. And then Chris was at home with three kids. And, and I came, it just, and I, I, I was pondering why I came to this resolution. But I think I came because, like, repentance is linked with grace before you go any further with changing your mind. And one thing I had started doing all those years is listening to the daily audio Bible every single day. And the Bible talks about being transformed, like renewing your mind. And I think what happened was as I listened to that Bible once a year for year after year, I think your mind does transform. And so I came, I was just working one day, um, as in snipper, whippersnipper working down in Gladstone. And I often listen to podcasts and I would have been, I might have been listening to the Bible or something else. And I just realized I need to change something. It's, it was just a logical thing. I need to change something. So just came home. Uh, you know, told footy I'm only training once a week, quit uh, touch footy on the Monday nights, like just made some changes. And then um, I told Krista, there, I'm freed some time, you can do stuff. But guess what? If we're talking about bitterness and resentment, she didn't want to. She had got to a stage where she didn't want my help and she didn't want me to do anything nice for her because like, that's what happens with resentment. You, it becomes your identity. You, you, you get so used to re-feeling it over and over again that, that that's who you are. And um, so I had to do some, some, you know, some clever things. Lucky I'm a smart guy. Um, which reminds me of a great uh, tongue twister that I'll tell you afterwards. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so what I did was, because I was offering all this stuff to Krista, didn't want any of it. And I just, so I ended up buying, actually I got the kids to buy her. That's a trick for you know, new players. Got the kids to buy her four singing lessons for her birthday. And I said, listen, the kids got you these, you're going to have to do them. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, she went and I said, oh, and it, by the way, if you like them, keep going, obviously. I'll pay for them. And, uh, and you go to this day, still every week, sing lessons. And, um, and I said, if you wanted to do stuff like performances, yeah, I'll, I'll make the time. I'll change my schedule, you know? And so um, it, for me personally, I had to unbuild a, like a 10 year brick wall uh, in reverse. Some people, you know, things might just go great for that too. That, that's why if you recognize it, you do something about it and you settle quickly because the longer it takes, it's not gonna help. So this is what Jesus says. Oh, well, this is what Paul says about Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So when men ask me in their marriages or in relationships, how should I act? I say, you act like Christ. I mean, the Bible instructs it to men. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. So this is your scripture you read when you, this is how Christ loved the church. Uh, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to my own advantage. So that's what I had to do because I don't know if most men are like me, but we consider um, that we're basically equal with God. <laughs> no, we don't really, but we do, right? We, we consider somehow that we have this, as men, we have this, you know, a surety above ourselves, about ourselves. Anyway, don't use it to your own advantage. Instead, uh, make yourself humble and um, being obedient to death on a cross. So anyway, that's what I advise people to do. Now, just quick sidestep on humility. Humility is not um, like hum humiliated or humiliation. They're two separate words, okay? So Humility is a noble choice to forgo your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence to the good of others before yourself. So when you think about Jesus humbling himself, he chose to forgo his status, using his resources. I know these are very business type words. And for the good of others before yourself. So he, Jesus Christ was not like, um, it was like there's just a different slant on those words. So simply put, Humility is a willingness to hold power in service of others. And um, it doesn't mean you're a doormat. In fact, true humility assumes the dignity or strength of the one possessing the virtue. Um, and it's more about how I treat others rather than how I think about myself. Did Jesus have a low view of himself? No. Okay. Um, so you can have... I mean, it's in definitions, but you can have a high view of your skills and what you do and still be a very humble person because it's, it's all about how you serve others. And just think about Jesus as the perfect example of that. Obviously, he is Christ. So my challenge today is if you can reflect on your relationships with others, either, I mean, marriage, kids are good ones because... You know, right in the first chapter of Genesis, God called us to be, he, he made us in the image of God and he asked us to reflect his glory. It's like one of the first commandments. So if your marriage and your family is not doing that, it's like your number one calling as a Christian is to reflect the image of God, okay? So if your marriage isn't doing that, if your family's not doing that, it's a probably a good place to sit down and repent. Sit down, start, how can I change things so that my marriage reflects Christ or brings glory to Christ. You just, and start making some changes, okay? Uh, of course, you need to um, confess to God and others in that process. But, um, but then in other relationships in, in this, in, among our own people or with outsiders, the challenge is to, to think, I, identify anything that's just out of order. Uh, Jesus said to settle quickly do it while you're still together, as in do it while you still have the chance. Sometimes things go and you lose your chance and that uh, leads to regret. So do it quickly while you still have the chance. And, um, and then, yeah, so, and then I was thinking about this song that we um, sang second, which is why I wrote down Waymaker. And I took a photo of the words, I think. which I can't find. Oh, just give me a second, sorry. It's funny when we talk, it says, shout for our God will make a way where there seems to be no way. There's nothing he can't do. And I was thinking about that because we need to involve God, but... Um, him as a way maker. And, and somehow when we sing these words, to me, somehow we presume that, once again, more on the abracadabra type level, like shout, you know, he will make a way. 
And, and I think we have to ponder of Jesus as the way maker. Like Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through him. I, I think we really need to, like rather than praying make a way Red Sea style, I think we need to really pursue Christ and find him as the way. Like, I'm struggling to just, when I saw Waymaker, I'm thinking it's, it's not a magical solution. It's not a, you know, it's a, we need to find Christ in this. Like, in our relationships, we need to find Christ. Um, and so when you think about Waymaker, don't think, you know, an instant where everything's smooth. Think about finding Christ and he will, he will light the path. And um, so when we're talking about repentance, when we're talking about changing our mind, it all comes back to the word of God, okay? This is not um, self-modification because it doesn't work. Christ has to change us and we need to do that by reading the Bible and spending time with him. You know, I just remember the third, I think it was the third song, talked about mercy being poured out like rain. And all I'm thinking about is that G. Hannah dump and the, of the fires that never go out. And, and I think that's what we need. We just need that mercy just, just, you know, just poured in like rain. So you, you need to find Christ, okay? His word is a lamp to my feet, light to path. If you want a road like that, nice high one, well lit, nice meadows, lots of GPS signal. Um, rather than a car park, um, the word of God is the lamp. Okay, so that's I think that's advice today of where you start. I, people say to me, you know, I don't hear God. Well, guess what? He's using you a great book. Start there. If you've done everything in there perfectly, then you can move on to audible hearing. Okay, but let's start with the word of God. The word of God is a light to your feet, uh, lamp to the feet, light to the path. Acts 11, 18 says, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay? So the encouragement today is think about your relationships, change your mind, heart, hopefully will follow later. Make some choices, seek Christ, seek the word of God, and let's see, let's see some things changed. You know? Um, anyway, David, I'll pray. Okay. Okay, great. Heavenly Father, I'm so glad that it is your kindness that leads us to repentance. It's, Lord, the, the Bible says that we were dead, we were buried, we were lost. So it is amazing grace that causes us to live again, and it is your kindness that causes us to repent. Lord, I'm thank you, thankful that it's the Word of God that leads our mind to be renewed, and so that if we want to change our mind about something, if we see something that's out of order and we want to change our mind, thank you that the answers are in the Word of God and we can make choices and cha change our actions and trust in you. So Lord, today I ask for grace for repentance. Not looking outside to see what other people have done to us, but Lord, coming and taking personal responsibility of how our life is and seeking Christ for a change repentance, a change of mind, turning around. And so Lord, I ask for grace for that today. May the spirit of repentance be upon the people of peace today and in all of our relationships. Amen.